what is the principle of the sequential form? To constantly renew and to constantly repeat. It has been always this, the, the secret of the sequential form. And I said at the beginning uh, tonight that we tried, not only me, but many composers, to completely avoid any formula, the same always different that I quoted, the theme, the motive. And now in a complete, in a very new way, the formula uh, is reintroduced into musical composition. Because all the different aspects of the 50s and the early 60s to deny, to exclude, are now turning again into a more, an all-embracing and more universal aspect of composing. For example, we tried completely to avoid any recognizable uh, rhythm. Periodicity was excluded, because periodicity is easy to capture and to remember. The music was very aperiodic during the 50s. We tried, like the painters in the abstract, so-called abstract or informal uh, period, to avoid any melody that you could whistle afterwards or sing because that would capture the attention. And then you would always try to find out what is happening to this melody in the music. So, uh, as I said, always the same light and new object being shown in that, that light was absolute. Any recognizable musical sound was avoided in electronic music. I tried, uh, well, I said always, don't imitate the traditional musical instruments or don't imitate a car sound or a bird, because then people start thinking of, of the burden of the car rather than listening to the music. But it was a certain weakness that is a characteristic for each exclusivity, each system that defines itself as taboo in the art as well as in life. Whereas already with the song of the youth, where a, a boy's voice appears in that strange world of electronic sounds which you cannot name, uh, led me to sentences which were completely misunderstood in the 50s, where I said, it's more interesting to find an apple on the moon than a moonstone. It's much more magic, because a used object, a banal object, takes magic on in such, an, such a completely abstract and in, even informal uh, context where we cannot name the things if we find a nameable thing that is totally magic. And uh, all is a question nowadays, what predominates in a piece when naturally you quote, you, you have quotations, citations, or you use an object, a found object, the objet trouvé. If it's stronger than what you have composed around, then what you have composed sounds like sauce around a piece that really is strong. And everything that is old is stronger than what is new because it's known. It has a name. We identify it, etc. So one has to be very careful introducing, it must be the opposite, introducing the known into the unknown because the known is always, tends to be stronger, like an old chair, it, it speaks. The last example is taken from Curry, and we come, like in the, all, in the other um, categories, to an extreme again, which is the instant, the moment. The term moment, the way I use it, doesn't mean a short time, a fraction of time. A moment can last forever. A moment can be, as we say sometimes in the current language, and it, a moment can be an eternity. And, and a mo moment can be so short that we can hardly uh, experience it. So the absolute time has, is, is not... Uh, characteristic for the moment. What it means is extreme verticality, orientation to the, towards the here and now. Not relating what is happening in music, for example, to what has happened before, like in a development, and what's going to happen next, like in a development, or in a sequence, where I say what's now is nice because it's now soft and before it was loud, or it's fast because before it was uh, slow. And next would be good to have something that is in the medium speed, etc., and in the middle range. So always thinking when you experience something, when you do something, of what 
happened before and what's coming next. And this general attitude, attitude to uh, interpret everything in terms of development has become so extreme. Let's go for a short moment out of the music that you hardly meet people who, who can describe something without saying it was like last year when we were, etc. They describe something that is now, here and now, by something that they have experienced before. They relate it immediately to the past. Or they say, well, now it's, it's not very nice, but it was wonderful at earlier times when I was 20. Or uh, you will have a good time in 30 years, but now it's a miserable time, etc. This total relativation of the, of the now, of what is now, has become predominant in our interpretation of our life and of, of uh, music. Too. I remember when I com composed as a student, as I say, as an exercise, uh, certain fragments within a given composition, and the teacher uh, said, uh, well, where did you derive it from? I said, from nothing. And he said, well, uh, uh, you need it as a contrast or what? It's not contrasting. I said, no, I just need it because of itself. He said, you are illogical. There's, well, there, where is the logic? Because you could only think uh, that there is a logic to derive something, to make something that is now, as being to interpret as the result of what was before and as the reason for something that's coming now. So realizing this, in, in several of my earlier compositions where I found I could easily interchange certain moments and it wouldn't change at all, the, the music, because they were strong enough to exist in themselves. I uh, reversed the whole way of composing up to that moment in my work, 61, 60, 61. I had composed always with the concept breaking out of continuity. For example, I was obsessed by the idea of composing inserts. I had comp prepared an entire composition. I saw it in my mind. I heard it in my mind, so to speak. I heard it inside. And then I composed it out. And then when I was, so to speak, fulfilling my own promises that I had given to myself, or my own systematical preparations, then I found I wasn't satisfied. And I broke into it, and I composed inserts. This you find everywhere, in sight mass, in groups for three orchestras. Something happens which is not justified. It breaks up. And when you come to an extreme with this, with this feeling, then you compose nothing but inserts. And there's nothing left where it is inserted. And that's what happened in Momenta. I started uh, with the extreme opposite method. I said, I want to compose now a musical moment that is existing in itself. It's, it's, it's not related to anything. So naturally, I had determined the number of participants of the performance, the players, the singers, etc., there's already a restriction. Then when, you, when I started composing the second moment, <coughs> yeah, I tried to avoid everything that I had done in the first one. Not to repeat anything. So if it was for brass, it would be for singers. But then I thought, Jesus, I have to compose more moments, so I better take only the women and, and keep the men for another moment. Then uh, percussion, well, be careful, uh, not the percussion yet. So another moment. You see, when you reach the third, the fourth, the fifth moment, then it becomes harder and harder to do something where you don't repeat what you have used before, no matter how far you want to go. So composing always something different and as different as possible becomes increasingly difficult. So one has to be extremely economical in order to compose independent or self-contained musical events. And that led me then to an overall planning of, a, of an entire composition that lasts nowadays more than an hour and a half, where I really started distributing the forces very carefully in order to, to create a maximum of individuality of all the different moments. Then the next thing is that you see, well, there are naturally certain moments which have more in common than other <coughs> moments. Then there starts the grouping. I say, oh, there's a group of moments where obviously the solo soprano is predominating. There's another group where 
obviously the percussion is pre predominating and that's good because then we have groups of, of moments. Uh, finally, I came to a system where then from that independent situation of all the moments, I started interconnecting the moments. But I was able to determine if a moment was related, not at all, or a little bit, or very much, with the past and with the future. And about that I'm going to talk tomorrow. I give just a short excerpt, no, the end, from a work which is called Carré, where for the first time I tried to concentrate on the instantaneous forming, or the forming of moments. And it was, at the time when I did it, as I said, quite opposed to everything that has happened. Not in vain, many people have written about the completely illogical uh, way, of my, uh, comp way of composing at that time and since. But in the meantime, people have become more familiar with the concept that uh, putting the whole concept of, of uh, composing upside down and say, I start with just with the here and now, and then we will see if there is any past and future. That is a secondary question. That, that this leads us to a new approach to composition in general. And whereas I have called the development as a dramatic way of forming, directional, the sequ sequential way of forming as an epic, I could call the instantaneous way of forming, the, the forming of moments, of individual moments, as the lyric. And in our Western tradition, the composition of lyric forms, I can say now, is very rare, extremely rare, because there's a predominating tendency uh, towards uh, sequential composing, forming, and uh, development forming. Whereas, as you certainly all know, in Oriental tradition, let's say in the Japanese tradition, the lyric forming is much more um, used the haiku composition of, in, in poetry, or the way moments in the no theater are composed, in the no music, uh, occur very often. Where the here and now is everything that counts, and they do not necessarily derive or base their composition on the contrast. Like in a no theater, you might just follow moment by moment by moment. Every moment counts, but there is, for long stretches, neither directionality that that you feel where he is going to or where it's leading to, where it's coming from, you don't think about it. You're just fascinated by the counterpoint of the foot, the voice, the hand, the head, the eye, of that counterpoint, and in every position. And you don't care really for, for a long time, sometimes for two, three hours, you don't care about uh, the path, what happened before, afterwards, because there's nothing but that. And he doesn't try to uh, shock or to surprise by changing all of a sudden, and when such a thing comes, a sudden change, then it is incredibly exciting, then he breaks out of that, uh, of that moment uh, form. Uh, we have a few examples in, in songs of Schubert, and perhaps the first, uh, the beginning of this concentration on the lyric, lyrical aspect of, comp of forming was, again, in the music of Weber. He composed uh, his early pieces, in particular Opus 5 to the piece for string quartet, but even more the piece for violin and piano, pieces for violin and piano, Opus 7, or the orchestra pieces, uh, Opus 10, or the Bagatella, Bagatellen. Um, in very short, well, we can say uh, movements. These are moments. Psychograms were they called at the time because the, the music critics didn't know what, how to call it. Uh, it's extremely condensed, sometimes only 12 seconds, 20 seconds long. That was it. Just put in the air and nothing derived and nothing followed. And that was it. such very strong moments that were like, like Schoenberg said uh, in the, at, at the preface, in the preface of the Bagatellen, whereas others would write a whole novel 
this composer just expresses in in an instant condense he expresses in an instant what other others would write a whole novel about in extreme uh, concentration well I have uh, in my work by more developed developed the the instantaneous uh, forming, the moment forming. And naturally now we can interpret as a development as one particular um, organization of moments. And not, not chop a development into, into little bits. It's a different method and different way of thinking and it leads to, to different music. I just uh, play the, the end of Carré for four orchestras and four choirs.
may realize that the great difficulty in moment for forming in moment forming is that hair raising problem to create to create unity because what makes unity if everything is based primarily on individuality well it must be the degree of presence that everything is present because as soon as certain events are more present than others then again, we have secondary things, we have transitions, we have accompaniment, we have preparations, we have echoes, and that means development or sequences. It is very difficult to compose moments which have equal degree of presence. Something must have become clear tonight that points can be determinate, variable, statistical. Groups, determinate, variable, statistical. Masses, determinate, variable, statistical. That points being determinate can be in a development. That points being variable can be in a development. <coughs> that points being statistical can be in a development. That points being determinate can be in sequences. Points being determinate can be in moments etc. That this uh, order of three times three terms is um, an order in which every um, term can be combined with any other term. And what it is ultimately leading to 
is not to avoid, as I said before, once we have reached statistical structuring, the point structuring or the group structure. Once we have reached chance operations or statistical ways of, of uh, composing to forget about determination and directionality or variability. Once we have reached the lyric to forget about the dramatic and epic. But naturally, what we are driving at is that universal concept where you have within a given composition one layer which is very directional, very dramatic, going from a precise beginning to a precise end and then changing direction and being with points. Another one uh, is superimposed at the same time and composed with groups which are in sequences and then a mass is completely momentaneous, instantaneous, superimposed and then it leads to a section where you have just one uh, characteristic predominant, etc. That all these different aspects begin to intermodulate each other, to in influence each other and are composed, what the word says, composed. So that not from work to work we would have different directions, but within a given composition uh, we would have all the possible forces. Finally, I would like to say this seems, having been a typical lecture of a typical German uh, professor <laughs> who uses his nice terms in order to clarify that wonderful, wonderfully uh, rich and indeterminable field of music. We have perhaps understood that these terms can be applied to any music, to any folk music, to any uh, traditional music, to any folklore music, to any new music. Why do I do it? As there is that famous sentence, composer or artist, create, don't talk. Because I have experienced myself that using these terms, um, has sharpened my consciousness. We could say very sensitive people feel it anyway when they hear the music and they don't need these mental, uh, this, this mental material. Well, there is a very secret feedback between sensitivity and consciousness because ever higher consciousness sharpens the sensitivity and that is what I am trying to do and that's why I spent time together with you in telling you about my way of approaching music that I have composed that others have composed post facto after it has been composed in order to sharpen the consciousness and with the sharpened consciousness become more sensitive. Thank you for your attention.